Okay. Heine HQ team, please advance to the next slide. And good morning, good afternoon, and good evening, everyone. It gives me great pleasure to welcome you today to our global seminar focusing on indirect ophthalmoscopy. Now, it truly is a global seminar. This afternoon, we have participants from over 41 countries, so we're very, very pleased to have you with us. And I'd like to thank you for your interest and also for spending the next hour together with us. Now, we've put together a really interesting program for you, and I hope that when we complete the program, you'll look back on this hour uh, together as an hour well spent. We have two very special guests with us today. We have Dr. Ahmed and Dr. Mills. Dr. Ahmed, um, in addition to holding several academic positions in the US and Canada is currently the medical director for the PRISM Eye Institute in Toronto, Canada. And his colleague, Dr. Michael Mills is the vitroretinal specialist and his partner at the PRISM Eye Institute. So we're very fortunate to have Dr. Ahmed and Dr. Mills join us today to share their expertise with us. They'll take us first um, into a bit of a deeper dive into the true value and importance still in the diagnostic process that the indirect ophthalmoscope presents in the busy practice today. And then there'll also be a second segment where we'll be discussing some specific clinical diagnostic uh, applications and challenges. So we look forward to that. Um, now, as you may have surmised from our invitation, um, we're also using the context of this webinar to introduce our newest binocular indirect ophthalmoscope, the brand new Omega 600. Next slide, please. There it is. Now in preparing my opening remarks for today's webinar, it occurred to me that you probably are familiar with Heine as a company more through our products. You may have been uh, using and familiar with um, our direct ophthalmoscopes, with our retinoscopes, and most certainly our indirect ophthalmoscopes. Next slide, please. And here you see the Omega line of indirects. Now you may be familiar with Heine from the Omega 100, which is on the very left. We introduced this in 1983. So that's almost 40 years ago. So if this is what pops to mind when you think about Heine indirects, it may date you a little bit. Um, although there are still a number of Omega 100s in use today, so that's not necessarily the case. But you're most likely familiar with Heine through your interaction with either Omega 180, Omega 200, and most recently, the Omega 500. So it occurred to me that you may know us through our products, but you may not be that familiar with Heine as a company. Um, so I thought I would maybe just engage in two or three minutes and, and you'll allow me to indulge me here a little bit to tell you about a few things that maybe you are not familiar with regarding Heine. Next slide, please. So Heine Optotechnik was actually founded by my grandfather in 1946 in this very building in a small town south of Munich called Hesching. Today in the third generation, we are still 100% family owned and we are still a completely independent company. And today we still develop and manufacture all of our products exclusively in Germany like we have since our founding. So last month, we actually just celebrated our 75th anniversary, which is really quite a milestone in today's age. You may be, or as I said, you're familiar with our products in eye care. What you may not be uh, familiar with is that Heine is actually active in nine other medical disciplines or specialties. Next slide, please. Specialties like pediatric medicine, family practice, ENT, anesthesiology, dermatology, with products like surgical loops, otoscopes, dermatoscopes, illumination systems, and also laryngoscopes. So in fact, the eye care business represents approximately 20% of our business globally and 80% come from these other segments. We employ about 500 people worldwide. Next slide, please. 400 of our team members are now working in our brand new headquarters shown here, which we just moved into last year in a town about 20 minutes south of Munich called Gilching. So we moved from Hersching to Gilching. I know not the most easily pronounced names internationally, but <laughs> that's where we are. Can't change the, the town name, but we're so, so happy to be in our new facility. We have about 14,000 square meters, 140,000 square feet of state-of-the-art production and administration space. And this is where now all Heine products are built exclusively for all our global markets. 
We're a very highly vertically integrated manufacturer, which simply means that we like to manufacture all the critical components that go into our products ourselves. Next slide, please. So we manufacture all of our optical components ourselves in our optical division, where we manufacture around 25,000 mirrors and lenses every week just for our own production needs. We have our own injection molding facility where we injection mold thermoplastics for the housings, for example, also for the Omega 600. We actually have a tool and die division where we manufacture the injection molding tools that go onto the machines where we then injection mold the housings which is where the vertical integration comes in, the deeper we go into the manufacturing process. We have our own metal fabrication where we precision mill uh, materials like stainless steel and aluminum. And we also have our own electroplating facility. I would say right now, probably the most modern state of the art facility in Germany, since it was just approved um, in the course of this last year, where we nickel and chrome plate um, 15,000 parts and pieces every day for very high quality surfaces. For example, for our laryngoscopes, these products will be either high level sterilized or, um, uh, I'm sorry, high level disinfected or sterilized sometimes thousands of times during their lifetime and they require extremely high quality finishes. And then of course, we take all the parts that we manufacture ourselves here in Gericheng and then we assemble them. Even today, we continue to be committed to really investing heavily into our own manufacturing technologies, where a lot of companies are outsourcing much of their manufacturing, we continue to actually engage in insourcing. And what we feel is that the more technologies we have in house, the deeper an understanding we have for the technologies, as well as the skills required to really build the highest quality products. And having all this technical know how under one roof also helps us in the innovation process because having that deep understanding allows us to put technology together in really new and unique ways that creates innovative products that we hope will end up delivering significant and meaningful value to our customers like you and also for products like the brand new Omega 600 which is a direct result of this strategy. Next slide please. So that brings us back to today's webinar. So thanks for indulging me briefly and telling you a little bit about some things that you may not know about Heine, the company that stands behind the products. If I piqued your interest, you're obviously more than welcome to read more about Heine at Heine.com. Now, before we get to uh, Dr. Ahmed and Dr. Mills, just a quick housekeeping point. We hope certainly that the content of our webinar is going to be engaging enough for you that you really want to ask some questions while we are doing um, our presenting. So any questions that you have during the webinar, please use the Q&A function that you have at the lower right hand of part of your screen to ask us questions and we'll look to answer those during the webinar. And if upon reflection, you come up with some questions later on, please don't hesitate to write us. We have a special email for you called omega600 at heine.com. And we look forward to getting your questions there, which we'll be happy to answer as well. So without further ado, it gives me great pleasure to introduce Dr. Ahmed and Dr. Mills for their first session this afternoon. Gentlemen, the uh, video and the mic is yours. Thanks so much, Oliver. It's uh, great to be here with you here um, and to speak about uh, something that I think we're all passionate about. I, I love hearing the story of Heine and, and your you know, family run independent business. I think this is a, an example uh, for all of us in this day and age of you know, no, no disrespect for these big conglomerates and corporations where it's really hard to really get things done or, or, to, or in a way that's more, you know, family or, uh, you know, personal oriented, uh, you've been able to manage that. So I, I, I really enjoy hearing that story. And um, I mean, you know, I enjoy, I've enjoyed using, you know, high name products. I mean, since I was a medical student and a resident and, you know, buying my first uh, equipment, um, you know, uh, we had to choose which ones uh, we wanted to pick. And there were many different ones out there. It was Welch, Allen, Keeler, Heine. I can tell you, not, not because I'm doing this webinar, but I, I decided to pick Heine just because I thought, you know, precision German engineering, I, I liked the form factor of what was uh, being done. And I just liked, like, I liked the story. So um, it's kind of interesting how things become first circle now back as we talk about uh, some of the latest technology. Um, I, I am pleased to, to share the stage with my, uh, my co-speaker here, uh, Dr. Michael Mills will introduce just in a second.
but I wanted to just first get the, get the ball rolling here and really kind of set the stage in what we want to speak about, which is talking about what we believe is an important discussion on indirect ophthalmoscopy. You know, I mean, gosh, most talks I do end up being high tech and surgical, you know, gymnastics in the eye or, you know, innovative devices and implantable devices and things. And sometimes we forget the value of what we use every day in our clinical practice and how we've continued to evolve and improve those tools. So uh, both Michael and I are pleased to speak about what, on the first section here, which we'll talk about particularly the value and the importance of indirect ophthalmoscopy in clinical practice. And then we'll be speaking later on about techniques and specific ways and challenges in dealing with these, with these cases. Now, I am an anterior segment specialist. I deal with cataracts of all variety. I deal with complex anterior segment problems and glaucoma. As you can see, I'm still learning how to use the indirect ophthalmoscope. Uh, I thought it's a massage device to head up to the face on my head so I can relax on my couch in my office and just chill. But Dr. Mills tells me actually there is more value than this. And I'm just kidding, of course. Um, but Dr. Mills is our visual retina specialist at Prism Institute. We have a very large group of over, you know, almost 50 doctors and five clinical sites. We use lots of different equipment. Uh, and very recently in the last six months, uh, I, I was lucky enough to, uh, to acquire uh, a high knee indirect uh, ophthalmoscope, the Omega 600. And I shared it with Dr. Mills and all of a sudden uh, we ended up uh, buying many more devices for our practice, both for retina and for everyone else, because we saw um, you know, uh, what the benefit was. And we'll speak to that a bit more, but I want to just again, formally introduce Michael Mills, who's, uh, who's the back of the eye guy. Now, you know, we always debate, you know, what's more important, the front of the eye or the back of the eye. We won't get to too much debate here, but uh, of course, you know my bias, but I will say that the back of the eye is important. Let's get some polling here. So what, I, what, what I'm going to ask you to do, and we'll have Michael give some commentary as you answer these questions here. The first question is easy, guys. I'm expecting a pretty high turnout of votes. I, I already see uh, almost a third of you have voted already. Uh, and the question is, do you currently use binocular indirect ophthalmoscopy? So we almost have half of you voting. Looks like you guys are all awake, which is amazing. Uh, I'm gonna just uh, share the poll results here. And, and Michael, this is a bit reassuring here. We've got about 90% of folks use indirect ophthalmoscopy. So any thoughts on, any quick thoughts on that? Well, I mean, we all know that's a great technique. And, and, and with, the, with the, the appropriate device and some practice, uh, dilated pupil and, uh, and or your ability in a cooperative patient, we can get a great view of the important structures in the posterior pole and the periphery and very, very important to be able to do it. And I'm glad to hear that uh, so many people are actually making good use of it. Well, let's keep on pushing here. Uh, my next question here is part of your pre-op evaluation prior to cataract or anterosegment surgery, do you perform routinely a dilative fundus exam to assess the posterior pleural and peripheral retinal pathology? And here the answers are pretty straightforward. It's either no, it's yes, or it's referred to a retinal specialist. So I'll let people answer. Again, I, I, I love to see the interaction here. We've got you know, about 40% uh, of people voting. I'll give you another few seconds. And I wanna again, put a plug in for the Q and A function. Uh, Michael and I will monitor that and, um, and bring up any questions that come up. So please ask any questions you want. It can be really hard. It can be softballs if you want, no problem. Um, okay, so here, here we have, again, I'm, I'm happy to see that the majority of folks here overwhelmingly do this. Uh, some refer and, and some don't. So Michael, I think probably not much to discuss there. I think uh, perhaps my job will be a little bit easy to, to talk about the value, but I'm gonna, I'm gonna share some interesting facts with, um, with you know the whole pre-op discussion. Let's go into the question about diabetic patients. Now, this is, a uh, question about diabetics. Now, whether they're pre-op or not, let's just talk about the, the um, you know, the, the diabetic patient. Uh, one, do you, you do not examine the posture segment. Two, you examine the posture segment with the direct ophthalmoscope. Three, you examine the posture segment with slit lamp indirect ophthalmoscopy with a 90 or 78. And then the last point is I use binocular indirect ophthalmoscopy as well. This will be interesting because I, I, I see that most people are examining some are using the direct, about one in 10 respondents. And I'm gonna share this very soon. You're not, all, you're not able to see the results yet, but you will see them shortly. Um, and it looks like the majority are primarily using slit lamp uh, lenses. 
um, with, uh, with, with, you know, similar amounts using binocular indirect, but, but it looks like, the, looks like not everybody using binocular indirect for diabetic patients. So Michael, what are, you, what are your thoughts about this? Well, I, I think that, you know, the, the essence of, of being able to try and get your best possible evaluation is in many cases is to be able to do a, a binocular indirect ophthalmoscopy of the, of the, of the fundus. And to be able to do that, we can see peripheral pathology, peripheral neovascularization, potentially vitreous hemorrhage, uh, but also pick up all of those, uh, those uh, small, uh, small peripheral uh, retinal degenerations or tears and holes that we, uh, we often do find. Yeah, I think that's an interesting point. I mean, I, I was interested in reading that, you know, although most diabetic eye disease presents in the posterior pole and a slit lamp lens will typically give you that, there are a subset of patients who may present more commonly beyond the arcades in the peripheral retina. And so it does seem like that's kind of what would be the standard of care. So is that something perhaps we can, we can get the audience to, uh, to, to consider? So uh, let, let me get into let me get into the my portion of my talk. I'm gonna I'm gonna sort of take the mic for the first section here and speak more from the uh, antisemic perspective. Um, talk about the rationale and, and and the value from a from a cataract surgeon. Now, as I said before, I I I do all kinds of difficult and routine cataract surgery, premium IOLs as well as you know suturing lenses in and everything else in between. Uh, and I, I'm gonna share with you my thoughts about what I feel in terms of the indirect ophthalmoscopy from an extra segment view. It's interesting because again, the retina guys are the ones you're talking about it, but I, I'm, gonna, I'm gonna talk about why I think it's important. This is what I train our residents and our fellows, which we have routinely in our, in our clinical practice. So a few points that are important. One thing I'm gonna share with you is that the ability to identify potentially concerning preoperative retina pathology is very important to deal with potentially prophylactically before doing intraocular surgery which can lead to potential serious retinal complications. I'll speak more about that shortly. The, the only way to get a dynamic view of the peripheral retina is using indirect ophthalmoscopy. Uh, we do certainly use adjunctive uh, wide field imaging and OCT as well in our practice, but it doesn't replace the role of indirect dynamic ophthalmoscopy where you really can't get this with using a typical wide field imaging system. We also have the ability to assess for a posterior vitreous detachment or a PVD. Why is this important in terms of uh, eye surgery? We'll explain that a little bit here as well. And of course, it gives us a nice zoomed out view of the posterior pole as well, which sometimes you kind of sometimes miss the, you know, you miss the, the, the forest for the trees sometime when you're only focusing with a slit lamp uh, lens. However, one of the challenges we do find are media opacities, whether it's a dense cataract or otherwise. And this is where I think technology has evolved as we'll hear about with indirect ophthalmoscopy. So I believe that my premise and my hypothesis is that it's important to do a full retinal exam prior to cataract surgery. And this is particularly important because it helps mitigate the risk of post-operative retinal detachment. Now, many of you may feel retinal detachment isn't a major issue these days. And it is true that modern day cataract surgery has improved this risk, but it hasn't eliminated it. The mere fact of going to the eye, uh, removing a lens, causing vitreous shifting and traction, and hydration all increase the risk of retinal complications in our patients, despite routine FACO. General population is one in 10,000, a high risk population, the risk is one in 50 of retinal detachments. In cataract surgery, compared to general population, the risk is higher. It's about one in 100 to one in 1,000 after routine surgery. That's a number I typically quote to our patients. But in high risk cataract surgery, the risk is one in 20. And whether you're an optometrist assessing a patient for, re for referral, or whether you're the operating surgeon or the ophthalmologist in, in play here, it's important to evaluate this. There are certain risk factors that are important to consider when we think about retinal detachment risk. These include male gender, this includes younger patients, includes patients who are axial myopes, and when there are surgical complications. Now, I fit two out of four of these. I'll let you, I'll let you figure out which ones they are. This graph just nicely shows you from a study of almost 18,000 eyes that was published back a few years ago. The risk in a kaplan meier curve here of potential confounders and potential variables that lead to the risk of retinal detachment. As you can see top left here, you see, if you're a male, the risk is higher. If you have an axial myope, the risk is higher again, as we said earlier. If you're a patient who is younger, as you see here, the risk is higher. And if there's, a, if there's a complication with a posterior capsule rent, particularly 
here with vitreous loss, the risk is higher. And so these are all important risk factors that we can sometimes control, sometimes we cannot control. This is particularly critical in younger patients where the risk of renal detachment is higher as we discussed earlier. And one of the reasons for this is likely related to the fact that many of our patients have an intact posterior hyaloid, which is still attached. And the fact that during and after cataract surgery, it's very common to see a posterior vitreous detachment occur. And when this occurs, this may result in traction in peripheral retina, particularly in areas of weakness. So identifying a PVD and identifying peripheral retina pathology is a very critical to mitigate this risk and deal with it prophylactically. The older we are, the more likely we have a PVD, as we show in this data here. This is an interesting study that basically found that patients who had cataract surgery who did not have a PVD preoperatively, the vast majority of them ended up getting one after. Almost 80% of people developed a PVD after lens extraction on an average of seven months. And interestingly enough, the presence of a PVD or lattice related to the retinal attachment risk. As you can see, if there was no lattice, the risk was lower. But the risk was highest if you did not have a PVD and you had lattice degeneration. That risk was significantly higher for developmental detachment than those, for example, that had no PVD and no lattice or PVD and no lattice. Again, emphasizing the importance of identifying a PVD, which I believe is easier to assess with an indirect than with a slit lamp. Michael may disagree with that, but I, I think it's interesting what he thinks. But particularly important for dynamic peripheral retinal pathology looking for the lattice generation. Because if I see this, I'm referring this patient to Dr. Mills to assess whether he should be, whether he would consider doing laser for this patient before I do cataract surgery. And for that matter, the same for me, at least, I consider for LASIK as well. In fact, for any intraocular procedure where we have any manipulation of intraocular pressure as well. And I think that's an important lesson and consideration for this. Uh, again, the ability to look at this is greatly assisted with the use of indirect ophthalmoscopy. A PVD can also be assessed with OCT as well, but again, uh, using ophthalmoscopy here really nicely shows a Weiss ring that can be present here in this patient. So, so again, I, I, yes. one thing to remember, uh, imaging is very helpful, uh, but you can't just, just because the posterior hyaloid is detached over the macula doesn't mean that they have a, 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 a complete PVD. So it is important to make sure you don't just take an OCT like this and look at it and say, wow, that looks good. You're going to have to see a Weiss ring and you're going to have to actually take a look at the periphery just to make sure it appears that they do have what we would consider to be a, a complete PVD, even though it's never 100% complete. Great pearl, Michael. That, that's, a, that's a fantastic yeah. pearl. Um, and so just to summarize again, when it comes to lens extraction and retinal attachment risk, um, there's you know populations that are higher risk. Uh, and we talked about these populations, but really uh, it's really incumbent. And certainly here in North America, I would almost say medical legally important to assess these patients particularly again for the concern for retinal detachment risk. So I just want to again uh, emphasize the critical importance of posterior pole and peripheral retinal examination uh, and potential prophylactic treatment for the anterior segment specialist, particularly around the time of cataract surgery. Dynamic binocular indirect ophthalmoscopy is the gold standard for assessment in addition to what else we do. Now there are of course other, other reasons that we would consider doing uh, and we need to do indirect ophthalmoscopy and for our next section, Dr. Mills will speak about that. He's also gonna speak about dealing uh, with challenges in uh, indirect ophthalmoscopy, as well as different ways to do retinal examination, which will be important. But what I'm gonna do now is I'm gonna hand it back to the Heine team, just to kind of talk a bit about technology. Like I said, we've kind of had the pleasure of working with the company and working with the technology in this area here. And let's, let's get back to some of the technology discussion. And I'll look at the Q&A and some of the questions here. Hopefully some of you are, are asking some questions here. Well, um, a good, unfortunately very rainy and cold afternoon here in Gilkey um, in, in uh, Bavaria. So welcome you know, to a big chunk of the world. And thank you, Dr. Ahmed and Dr. Mills for this very informative first part of your lecture um, on indirect ophthalmoscopy. So my name is Florian Enzinger. I'm leading the product management team here in Heine, and uh, together with my colleague Walter Loisa, I have uh, who's one of the sales directors uh, in Heine, 
we have the pleasure to present you the brand new Heine Omega 600. So I do hope you did like this very nice introductory video. Um, so this is the new Omega 600 from Heine. And you might ask yourself, why do we need a new indirect ophthalmoscope? And well, Heine has a very long history in providing diagnostic instruments to the ophthalmic community. And over the years, obviously, you know, we've talked to plenty of doctors users of our devices, users of uh, competitive devices. And we realized, wow, you know, there's plenty of room for improvement. And one of the key factors that we heard back of is the impact of the weight of the device on ergonomical issues that the users have. And I mean, lots of the people are wearing this device all day long. And that creates neck problems. And interestingly, if you look into statistics, it shows that 33% of ophthalmologists suffer from neck issues. And if you look into the general community, it's just 16%. So it clearly shows that the diagnostic that you do with the patient and with the devices that you're doing having an impact on ergonomical issues. So because of that, this was really one of the major points that we wanted to address when we started this project. But, you know, it's not only the weight, there are certainly other things to improve compared to our predecessor, compared to other competitive devices. And that's, for example, you know, if we can make, we looked into making this device easier to use. Uh, we also looked into, can we potentially increase the visibility of the details of the retina? And last but not least, you know, we also looked into what are difficult situations that you're dealing with in your daily practice, um, like media opacities, and can we provide support or a tool that helps you in those difficult situations. So we started our journey, you know, with the goal to provide you certainly with the most comfortable indirect ophthalmoscope, and we wanted it to be absolutely intuitive to operate. And last but not least, you know, we want it to be the instrument that's providing you the best possible details of the retina. And all of that in, in a high quality level that really supports your needs long-term. So Walter, what, what do you think? Do you think, um, you know, we started that mission and do you think we accomplished our mission with this device? Thanks for the question, Florian. What I would like to say is only, um, you have the chance, you have the possibility to, to discover more with less weight, which is what we want to do. Um, we have the lightest uh, indirect ophthalmoscope in the world right now, and we managed to get it 20% lighter than any other competitor on the high-end uh, scale. Um, what does it mean for you? It means that with less weight here, less neck problems, and just simply better ergonomics. The question is, what did we do to reduce the weight in, the weight in that uh, amount, in that 20%? What we did was actually pretty simple, redesign everything. That's what we had to do. So we started with new materials, very light, very high quality, very durable. We also had a new different concept of a battery. So if you have a look at this, this is our battery right now. This, yeah. That's how you switch it, how, that's how you place it. And um, yeah, well, small battery. Small, well, battery. small battery is one thing and it's 
you know, it's pretty obvious, like compared to the battery size that we had previously, that this is reducing weight. But at the end, you know, the question probably is coming up, what's the impact of that small battery in regards to the runtime of, of the device? So maybe you can say a few words to that, Walter. Yes, exactly, thank you. I think um, obviously the first thought is smaller battery, less life. What do I do in my practice? It's pretty easy as Heine, we guarantee you that you will have the possibility to work it, to work with our Omega 600 for up to eight hours without problems without needing to, to recharge in a normal clinical environment. And the other thing that I can tell you is um, we offer also a charging case like this one. So this is the battery, this is the case, just the USB cable, and then you can recharge your battery and you're up and running for the rest of the day in case you need it. So um, that's really nice. And I think it's a good concept, reducing weight, but at the end, you know, weight's just one thing, but there were other goals that we tried to achieve, like increasing the comfort, increasing the intuitiveness of use, as, as well as the diagnostic capability. So Walter, maybe you can tell us a little bit on where is that reflected on the device? Yes, of course. Um, I think the most important part is following. Um, you're, you're seeing already a picture of our device there in the front uh, in our slide. And you will be able to see the only cable which is exposed in our Omega 600. That's the only cable that you will see. And that means you will have no fiddling, less cabling, obviously. And we're talking about less weight. So that's what we wanted to do. And this makes uh, the device obviously more convenient um, in several ways. Just to give you a small example, um, if you're right-handed or left-handed, you know this influences how you need to operate the device and how you need to do the diagnostic. In our case, it's pretty easy. If you're right-handed or left-handed, you just, just have the possibility to change your uh, light control from here to here with just adjusting a screw. You can do that yourself pretty easily. So that's one, one of the ways that we have seen uh, in order to make the product very, very usable for you. And obviously we have a very special neckband that we have created so that it's very comfortable for you to wear for long periods if needed. Um, one other topic and probably the most important besides wearing and batteries and all these kind of things is that uh, you have a precise diagnosis and that's exactly what we need to give you. We have to give you and we do want to do it. So how do you do that? How do we offer you this um, ideal diagnostic? A um, couple of things. The whole of the optics of this, of this device are made here in Gelking in our factory designed by us, produced by us in glass so that they will last for a long time and they will be in 10 years exactly as good as right now. No plastics like the other devices. The other thing is we have the high quality of LED. LED is not the same, the same in, in every device, you know, the cheap ones and the good ones. So you have the LEDs here. And not only that it will last for a long, long, long time, but it will also give you the right color that you need uh, for doing your diagnosis. So you have a very true color uh, situation there. And last but not least, we have um, the 3D view with this device, which is extremely good, so that you have the possibility to do a better diagnostic, even in small pupils. Great features, I think, but um, there is something unique too, which is the vision boost. Florian, maybe you can tell us a little bit about it. Certainly. So the vision boost addresses basically what I mentioned as the last point when we started this journey, supporting you in difficult uh, diagnostic situations. And, and at the end, you all know much better than us that in a progressively aging population, media opacities become more and more common. And that makes the diagnostic of the retina much more difficult due to the limited vision that you have through the cloudy lens. So we intensively thought about how can we support that situation. And this is the feature that we've created, the vision boost. So you might ask yourself, so what does the vision boost actually do? And the vision boost allows you to safely increase illumination up to 245% of the regular light intensity. And our testing has shown that due to this higher light intensity, it provides up to 20% more details of the observed area. So very nice 
a tool to support you in that situation. And we will hear a little bit more uh, from Dr. Ahmed and Dr. Mills in, in the next lecture on how does that reflect in the daily, in the daily um, diagnostics. But before we're handing over to Dr. Mills and Dr. Ahmed again, Walter, maybe you can summarize one last time the four major values that you get from the Omega 600. Thank you, Florian, and sorry for taking time for these things, but we are just so thrilled about our products. We love it. We are proud of it. So I hope uh, this comes through. Um, just four things that I would like to, to highlight. First thing, we have the lightest weight, weight with the advantage that, that, that it brings for your neck and, and the usability of the device. We have the most precise diagnostic because of the glass, the LED, and the true color. And you have a very long lasting investment as it is a standard thing for, for high inequality. The other, uh, last but not least, is because of the sleek design that we have, uh, the less cabling and everything, um, the device is much more easy to disinfect than uh, usual devices. So we're pretty convinced of what we're doing. We love it, we're proud. And um, thank you for bearing with us. Um, I would like to pass over, to hand over again to Dr. Ahmed and Dr. Mills. So have a nice day, thank you. Thanks so much, Florian and Walter. Great, great discussion. There was a couple of questions that came up. I know Michael answered them as well. There was a question, a couple of questions that people asked was about the weight. Uh, how much lighter is it? And I think it's about 20 or 30% lighter um, than previous generation indirects. Is that correct? It's 20%. Yeah, great. And as far as the charger and if it's easy to change in the battery, any comment on that? There was just a question about, about how easy is it to change and that, that's a pretty easy thing. Let me just show you this. You do that. You have the charger with a new battery. I'm not even seeing what I'm doing, but that works. Takes right, Walter, 15 seconds. Walter's showing off. He can do without looking. That's a no look. <laughs> I'm trying for. That's, that's very <laughs> impressive. Very impressive. Well, uh, thank you so much for, for reviewing this. And I, and I was interesting because, you know, some of the comments we've seen coming up on the on the chat group, uh, talk about how this is, you know, the sexiest indirect ophthalmoscope that they've seen, which I, which I wouldn't disagree with. Um, you can see that Michael, Michael Mills is just displaying this on his head. He basically was born with it. Um, <laughs> but uh, you can see how he definitely brings the sexiness out in him. But in reality, it is a very elegant uh, tool. Um, I, I, I love form factor, you know, I mean, not just the functionality, but the form factor and, you know, the design, the curves, the smoothness, the lack of wires. The buttons where they're placed, the knobs where they're placed. Um, you know, even for me being an astrosegment surgeon, it's 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 really nice to see that. So so great job, and I love I just love the passion that you guys have, and the and how proud you are of of um of what you've done. I think you deserve you deserve that. You know, um, we're gonna get back to um to talking about um about indirect ophthalmoscopy and particularly speaking about uh you know some techniques and some of the uh, challenges, um. And uh, maybe we'll just put this poll up here before we start. And maybe we, because I know many of you do use indirect, but maybe you could answer this in the sense of perhaps what the reasons you feel people don't use it. Is it because you don't see the value in it? You're uncomfortable with the technique? Um, you, you're, you use wide field imaging anyway, so what's, what's the point of doing indirect if you already have wide field imaging? Is a common thing I've seen people ask. And you find that the media passes are too challenging. Um, and so you do the cataract surgery first and then you evaluate afterwards. So um, again, appreciate the, 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 uh, the answer. We've got a lot of people online here, 160, 170 people have been on here, which is great, wonderful to see the great audience we have internationally. Um, so we've getting people to vote in there. And again, I realize many of you do use indirect, but uh, let's just kind of share the results here. It sounds like some of the reasons are uncomfortable technique, while others perhaps feel maybe that there are other modalities that can be used as opposed to doing uh, indirect uh, ophthalmoscopy. So let me, uh, let me hand it off to, uh, to Michael Mills. As I said, Michael Mills is, uh, is uh, my colleague here in Toronto Prism Institute. He sees a lot of retinal pathology, a lot of retinal patients. Sometimes he sees like 100 patients a day, um, although I don't think he can count that high, but he does see all those patients. I know the many of them are mine as well. Um, and Michael, maybe you can take it from here and just talk about uh, your perspective from a VR perspective. Uh, thank you very much, Ike, and uh, thank you, uh, Heine, for inviting me to uh, to talk a little bit about the uh, Omega 600 and also really, though, the value of, of binocular indirect ophthalmoscopy. 
um, you know, I was I was uh, pleasantly surprised to uh, initially be loaned uh, one of these ophthalmoscopes, the uh, Omega 600, and I really wanted to try it out. So I, I've, I've essentially used it exclusively in one of our clinics uh, every single day that I'm in clinic to try and get an understanding of the features, the ergonomics, how comfortable it is. And, and really, it is the lightest and the most comfortable uh, binocular indirect ophthalmoscope I've ever tried. Um, the, uh, the, the ability to, to use it, to put it on, to, to recognize how it sort of, sort of is comfortable on your head and that you can use it for extended period of time. It's uh, extremely important for those who, who use it regularly, but really for any user, because it just pops right onto your head, you get the adjustments in place and, and we can get to taking a look within 20, 30 seconds. So what is really the value of binocular indirect ophthalmoscopy in, in, a, in, a, in a clinical practice? And really from a vitreo retinal perspective, uh, in our practice, I see a lot of the, the patients uh, uh, of other, some of the other anterior segment surgeons, and I try and understand what they're doing so that I can understand what, what impact that may have on the retina and the vitreous. So when do we use it? Pre-op cataract or retinal surgery, uh, patients who present from the ER um, with flashes, floaters, uh, shadows, uh, vitreous detachment, and retinal breaks. We see these all in our clinical practice. And to be able to assess these appropriately and be able to look at the retina in a complete fashion, that's where we need the binocular indirect ophthalmo uh, ophthalmoscopy, in addition to the slit lamp biomicroscope. Uh, here you can see in that photograph that uh, is there, we can see a treated retinal tear um, with uh, fresh, fresh uh, barrier laser burns. Next slide, please. So some of the other uh, times when we can use it, uh, with macular checks for those of you who may be doing uh, intravitreal injections or will be in the, the near future, uh, we can check the, the macula when a patient comes in, there's a change in vision or uh, uh, in between visits when they do step into the clinic, we, we can take a quick look at the macula and see, you know, there's no bleeding, there's nothing else happening there. Uh, we're looking for in other patients such as diabetics, um, things like peripheral neovascular processes, and uh, here in this, uh, this photograph, we can see with a blue filter on the, 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 uh, the bio that we can see this area of non-perfusion and neovascularization. Uh, Follow-up exams, of course, for retinal breaks and as an adjunct to an exam before or after some intravitreal injections, we always wanna make sure we have perfusion of the central retinal artery uh, because we've raised the pressure after we've made the injection and we just have to in ensure that there's continued perfusion. Um, it's also able to work through media opacities. Many other methods and modalities don't. And it's also, in my hands, I find it very easy to, to put the indirect on very quickly and get a good view. And it's all about practice and technique. Because if you have practice and have technique, just like all the other things that we do, both diagnostically and surgically, the more you practice it, the more that you get comfortable with it, um, with good skill set, you're going to be able to do much better. Next slide, please. So direct ophthalmoscopy, we're all, we're all familiar with that. Um, it's done dilated or undilated. It's portable, it's inexpensive. Uh, we learn it as medical students all the way into being residents. Uh, people who are very uh, skilled at it, they can do a great job at, at looking at the, the retina. Primarily, it gives you an upright image, no stereopsis, uh, close working distance. Uh, in this COVID era, it's not been so handy. So certainly you don't wanna be doing this uh, what, and get too close to patients if you don't have to and certainly that's one of the, the negative things about direct uh, ophthalmoscopy. It gives you 15 times magnification, but very small field of view. So it's good for looking at uh, the macula uh, when you don't have a slit lamp. It's good for looking at the optic nerve and details on the optic nerve, but much more challenging, of course, to go further than uh, out than the arcades. Next slide, please. So again, as mentioned, most, most valuable for visualizing the optic nerve and posterior pole. You can see on the diagram here on the picture here, the approximate size of what you can see using a direct ophthalmoscope. And uh, you know, we can see out somewhat in the periphery with, uh, with, if we're skilled at this and we work at it, uh, but it is challenging. You have to be close to the patient for quite a while. And, uh, and again, you know, there is this issue of being so close to patients both from, from the, the, the COVID era, but also in general, just being that close to the patient. Uh, some may find it, the patients may find it uncomfortable. 
Uh, certainly, it's very difficult to work with in uh, small undilated pupils and with AZ media. Next slide, please. So um, slit lamp indirect ophthalmoscopy, again, a slit lamp plus your high power a condensing lens, typically our 78 or our 90 diopter. Uh, we can use a undilated, work through an undilated pupil or a dilated pupil. Uh, gives us a real and inverted image and uh, typically a, a little bit further working distance uh, than direct ophthalmoscopy. Uh, we can get uh, about an 80 degree field max with a 78 diopter lens. Um, and if we have patients look in all the eight, uh, eight fields of gaze, then typically we can uh, get a good look at the periphery, but certainly not as full of view as with uh, indirect uh, binocular and indirect ophthalmoscopy. Next, please. So uh, bio, it's uh, binocular indirect ophthalmoscopy. Again, it's a, the patient must be dilated, have an enlarged pupil. Uh, working distance, typically 20 to 75 millimeters from the cornea, a real and inverted image, and uh, the image is actually closer to the examiner. Um, so with a 25 degree field of view, you have a 50 millimeter approximate working distance with a 20 uh, diopter lens. And the examiner is about 40 centimeters away, so it, it allows us to keep, uh, keep back if we need to be in, in a circumstance where there's con concern with contagion. Next slide, please. So here's, here's a, um, uh, an example of doing uh, indirect ophthalmoscopy. Normally, we would have the, the lights dimmed. This is a patient who presented with floaters and also presented with a decreased vision. Um, and he, uh, he uh, had a posterior vitreous detachment, but also happened to have a macular hemorrhage and a cordial neovascular membrane. So he's being prepped uh, prior to doing an intervitual injection. Uh, I was looking at his fundus and to ensure that there are no retinal breaks. It is actually very important to think about this if you're going to be doing intervitreal anti-VEGFs or any kind of procedure or surgery that you may induce movement of the vitreous, as Dr. Ahmed already said. We, do, uh, we may sometimes induce a PVD or we may just shift the vitreous and uh, patients who, who have any of these procedures performed, they may experience flashes or floaters or floaters alone. And it is important to, to, to take out your, to dilate the pupil and take a look because you can have a, um, uh, a retinal tear. I actually had a patient this morning who uh, I had seen previously who had, was having some uh, intravitreal injections for uh, a branch vein occlusion, good vision at 2030. And um, she received two injections, then developed a PVD with some floaters and had a retinal tear and lattice. I had to laser, stop the injections. I lasered her. Now I restarted today because she had re recurrence of the fluid, but extremely important to take a look. If I hadn't seen that and then continue with the injections, potentially the patient would have had a detachment. Next slide, please. So I, I find that uh, the, the bio exam is complementary to slit lamp indirect ophthalmoscopy. You can look at all the, the eight fields, but also you can then, from that, you can look to, to get some clues as to where you should look for peripheral retinal pathology. It's portable, easy to set up, allows for fundus exam in those who can't be easily positioned at the slit lamp hospital bed, the wheelchair, and can be used for a quick verification, retinal detachment, uh, vitreous hemorrhage, macular hemorrhage, and then certainly the central retinal artery occlusion post-injection and post if the people are doing, well, of course, the retina specialists on here, they're doing pneumatics. I mean, I, I, I recently saw a patient who someone had not checked after doing a pneumatic and the patient ended up with a central retinal artery occlusion. So very important to make sure you check for central retinal artery perfusion. It gives a wide, flu, wide field and allows for a scleral depression and a dynamic exam. Very important because that dynamic exam allows us using the stereopsis and, and, and the scleral depression to understand the peripheral pathology or pathology and determine, is it elevated? Is there fluid? Is there uh, attraction from the vitreous? And to, to really get a more complete view. So a lot of doctors, because it takes a little bit of time sometimes to learn the, uh, the technique, they kind of give up. And it's very important to do your best to work at the technique and recognize if you do it more frequently, you will get better at it and you will build to that great skill set that allows you to meet, do a complete exam. Next slide, please. So what, what do we wanna do? We wanna have the pupils well dilated. You want the, the op, ophthalmoscope on your head positioned well. You now have to have the PD appropriately done, uh, just like as you do with the slit lamp or the microscope. Illumination, um, the illumination should be mid-range. You don't want it too high because it's uh, very uncomfortable for the patient. You want the spot size to correspond to the size of the pupil, smaller, 
smaller smaller size uh, 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 delight for a smaller pupil and larger for a larger pupil. Uh, patient positioning, this is critical in the long run, both for the immediate exam, but also for the long run for the actual examiner to make sure that you ergonomically position the patient so that you don't end up with uh, significant problems with your neck and back. So the patient should be reclined at an appropriate height and uh, suitable working distance for the examiner. Next slide, please. So the room should be dimmed. Always make sure the lens is clean because it'll scatter the light if you don't have it. I often have seen people struggling with it and then you realize that they have um, you know, uh, alcohol or some other types of stains that are on their lens and they're not unable to see what they need to see. Patients should look in the eight directions of gaze and then the plus or minus scleral depression with the cotton swab. Next slide. So here we can see the, uh, the omega 600. You can see the balance on the left here where the, it's just a tap, I just put it on the stand here just to see how it's balanced with the battery in it. And of course the setup for the PD and for the uh, filters and the spot size on each side. Next slide. And again, just a few more sh uh, shots of the uh, Omega 600. Um, it has everything. You don't see the wires uh, in some other ophthalmoscope that may protrude. And again, has a good form factor, fits very nicely. Here you can see actually in action and uh, the same patient we saw previously. Next slide, please. So Ike, uh, we were gonna talk a little bit about medial opacities and some of the challenges. And you know, one of the things that people often will say is that they can't get past that cataract. They can't see um, past the cataract. And because of that, they never look at the retina. So really we have to emphasize how we have to be able to figure out ways to get past that, to try and see what kind of potential things that we are seeing there uh, in, in the in the retina and to determine and make sure we've mitigated all our uh, preoperative risks. Do you have any comments, Ike? Or yeah, I, I agree, Michael. I mean, you know, this this is. I mean, you, you know, you, you're examining retinas all day, and I think you know, for us, these media passes can be pretty significant. I think it depends on the kind of cataract, and I think getting a nicely dilated pupil is one thing that's important. But sometimes you just have a pretty dense opacity; it's hard to look through. And I think, as you saw from Florian's diagram. Uh, that's where the variable light can be helpful. I mean, for some cases, you want to turn the light and get that boost up um, significantly more. Other cases, you want to turn the light down a bit because it potentially is going to scatter. So I think that's where you want to be able to adjust it and having the, have the dynamic range to be able to use. Uh, the vision boost, I think, does help in, in certain cataracts with, with significant density. Uh, and I think that's where there's some advantages in having a, just a brighter um, light source. Right. And, and I think, so, you know, obviously we have the different types of opacities, the cornea, the cataract, the, the vitreous, and these do create a challenge. Of course, it requires a little bit of work to, to, to go through that. It's not as easy as the simple cataract. Um, uh, corneal and lenticular opacities, often we do sometimes uh, find a space where we can look through uh, part of the periphery there. Um, we know that the, these types of opacities, they can increase the glare uh, resulting from the, the, the light source. And often it's much more difficult to actually get a, a good illumination of the retinal surface. Um, sometimes we do have a cataract where we have a, a small windows where we can look through. And I also always use the other eye as a guidepost because sometimes the cataract or the opacity in the other eye or the patient is pseudophagic will allow us to see the fundus. If the other, if the other eye has many different types of peripheral pathology or diabetic changes, then we have to be concerned. If we see nothing in the other eye, it doesn't take away the fact that the, the eye that we're going to operate on has some, some challenges, but it, it reduces our, our concern at that point a little bit. Uh, the other thing about media opacities is, of course, using a bright light and using light. The light scatter is challenging for the patient, so we do have to remember that they may not tolerate the exam well, so we have to be able to tailor the light a little bit according to the circumstance. Next slide. So some of the tricks that we can use here, um, so we can use a smaller spot size, um, use increase the intensity of illumination such as with the vision boost. Uh, the good thing about the, the way that the that Heine has set up this uh, ophthalmoscope is that the, the illumination's normally kept in the, the mid range. Often uh, users of the ophthalmoscope will often, because there's many different people using it, will turn it on and it, it's often at a high illumination, which is, not only more than is necessary for most exams, but it's also uh, challenging for the patient to tolerate the exam. So having it in the mid range is very good. And then you can actually increase it 
when you do need to get through a media opacity. Um, of course, the, the, the binocular indirect allows us for a better complete view, better peripheral view, and um, it, it's relatively time efficient. So it, once you're comfortable with it, you're able to, to look very, uh, very quickly at a fundus and get a, a good a gestalt of what's going on. Um, the vision booth, again, a boost, as I said, allows for additional illumination uh, in cases with denser cataracts. Next slide, please. So, you know, again, I was fortunate to be able to try the Omega 600. It is a very light ophthalmoscope. Um, you know, I've got it on my head right now. It's kind of a little bit of a, uh, of a, a comical thing, but it, it, I do put it on and off many, many times per day. I found that this, uh, this, the battery here is able to last more than a day or two. Um, now, I don't keep the, the ophthalmoscope on all the time, but I do often uh, examine 30 or 40 patients in a day with, and check their fundi uh, using it. So it does last a long time. So it's very convenient that way. It's lightweight, it's portable. You can use it in your clinic, uh, hospital, bed, uh, hospital at the bedside, or even in the OR, of course, because no cables. Excellent optics and illumination and uh, just ease of, ease of adjustment and the long battery life. So overall, very, very impressed with the instrument. It works quite well. And uh, so I, I think uh, they've done a great job at Heine. Great. Uh, thanks so much for, for running through that, uh, Michael. Um, really highlighting, you know, some of the different ways to approach, um, you know, a retinal examination and the benefits uh, of indirect ophthalmoscopy. I, I, I just want to just, just highlight one, one last slide from me, which just kind of just summarizes a little bit about what, you know, I, I feel kind of reiterating what, um, what, what Michael said is it, just, you know, this is, I think, just an essential part of the complete, you know, eye exam and whether it's for manifestations of systemic disease, symptomatology that could be related to the retina, vision loss, ocular health, it's an essential part of that, as well as pre and post-op. And there is some training and technique that kind of is involved uh, with some of the challenging cases. Um, I think uh, a versatile uh, technology, a piece of equipment, that allows us to manage all kinds of situations that are helpful. And as you heard, um, you know, this is really the gold standard with adjunctive technologies can be used in addition to that. Um, Michael, there's just a question that came up here from, from, the, um, from the group here. And they were basically asking about whether you prefer the patient to be seated upright or reclined uh, for binocular indirect ophthalmoscopy. What is your, um, what is your, what is your thought on that? Yeah, so I, I typically prefer the patient to be reclined um, where there is a reclining chair. If I happen to be in a place where the, we, the patient cannot recline for either a problem with the patient or a challenge, a, med a health issue that they can't recline because of uh, uh, a problem with their inner ear or something else, then I certainly will do with the patient uh, sitting up and certainly in a wheelchair. Uh, it's actually very handy for patients in wheelchair. I often will do it for patients who even come in for a diabetic check and uh, I use a higher magnification lens to be able to use a binocular indirect with the patient not having to get into the uh, examination chair. Uh, but generally I prefer the patient uh, tilted back and allows them to get the correct head position. Also much more, much easier to do a depressed exam in a patient who's tilted. Um, you know, they have to have their head firmly positioned against something and uh, you want to be gentle when you do it, but uh, but having them having them not moving back and forth is extremely important. Great, thanks, Michael. Well, that basically uh, concludes uh, our teaching um, you know, slides and our presentations, and we really uh, appreciate the opportunity to share our thoughts. It's, it's been great to kind of just uh, get back into what the important parts of the eye examination, particularly indirect ophthalmoscopy. Uh, I just want to congratulate you, Heine. I'm just super impressed with the company. Um, with the support that you guys have provided to us and others and the technology you've brought forward. It's easy to sit back and just say, this is a equipment that's been around for a long time. Let's just kind of just cruise through this, but, but you haven't done that. You push the limits and uh, we really appreciate that. And I think it's important that we support that as well. So I hope that we've given some useful guidance on indirect ophthalmoscopy and thanks for the opportunity to present. Thank you, Michael, for, for being great. And also for watching my back. Everyone needs a really good VR specialist to watch your back. So who can do a great examination uh, with his equipment. So thank you. Well, thank you to both of you, thank first you. of all, for really a fantastic, fantastic uh, session. Um, I think some really great discussion and insights in the importance still 
as you say, of indirect ophthalmoscopy today. And, and I think hopefully for many of our participants, some, uh, not just some, but many real practical pearls that they can take from this. And also thank you so much for your kind words, really. Um, it, it's, it's, it's really encouraging to see that the work that we continue to do at Heine um, meets with such resonance. And I'm so happy that the, um, you know, that the Omega made such a positive impression on you. You, uh, you were so nice to highlight so many different elements um, on the product. I, um, I think Walter and the sales department, you guys are in trouble. Um, we, we couldn't have said it, we couldn't have said it better ourselves. But no, the most important thing is that it's exactly what we strive for, is really to try to innovate and to provide something that provides real value, not just something new, but something that really um, you know, hits the target for, for you. So thank you very much for those kind comments. And, but most of all, thank you for really the insight that you shared with our participants today. And I hope that encourages everybody to, to perhaps take a second look at the importance of indirect ophthalmoscopy uh, in your practice. I also hope that you enjoyed our discussion a little bit about the technology and how we view the technology in the Omega 600. And that um, in short, like I had hoped at the beginning at my, my, um, in my short uh, opening, that this was an hour well spent for you, that it was something that you could really take something with you. Um, I think that we've answered almost all the questions or um, there are questions on the product, which I think what we'll do is we'll answer those um, for you afterwards. Um, and certainly any other questions that I said that come up either for um, Dr. Ahmed or Dr. Mills or for us, um, please just write them to omega600 at heine.com and we'll really be happy to get back to you on that side. So gentlemen, thanks again to you for all the time and for the insight. Uh, I really enjoyed it and I think our participants did as well. Um, and thank you all um, from the participation side again for your interest. I know that the time is valuable. We're a little bit over. So at this point, I will close the session and say really thank you to everyone involved. Bye-bye. Stay safe and have a great day. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye-bye. Take care.